Hello, my name is Kelly Tebow, and I'm with the New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, and I will be your organizer for this evening and would like to welcome you to our webinar on assistive technology. Thank you all for joining us. Um, before I have my colleague introduce the speaker for tonight, I want to cover some housekeeping items with you. All participants are muted. If you have a question, please type it in the question box and click send. Um, we will take questions all during the webinar. Um, however, we will have um, Matt answer the questions at the end of his presentation. Um, we will get to as many queries as time allows. And in addition to the, tonight's presenter, is available to take your qu questions on our Wednesday webinar blog, which is accessed from our homepage under the heading programs. Um, this blog is monitored um, for seven days, so feel free to look and post as qu questions as often as you like. Um, and the answers will be archived for future reference. If you missed part of the web pre presentation tonight or would just like to watch it again, an archive version will be posted to our website. We value your input, and in order to <clears throat> expand the webinar experience in the future, we need everyone to fill out the survey when you exit the webinar. The New Jersey Center for Tourette Syndrome and Associated Disorders, its directors and employees assume no responsibility for the accuracy, completeness, objectivity, or usefulness of this information presented. We do not endorse any recommendation or opinions but made by any member or physician, nor do we advocate for any treatment. You are responsible for your own medical decisions. Now, I'm going to turn over the introduction of our speaker to Christine Wharton, the Med Medical Outreach Coordinator of NJCTS. Christine? Great, thank you so much, Kelly. Well, good evening, everyone. As you heard, my name is Christine Wharton, and Kelly and I work together to bring you the NJCTS monthly Wednesday webinar program. I wanna thank you all for joining us here tonight for assistive technology to help with anxiety presented by Matt Denyon. We are so happy to have Matt here with us tonight. Matt has been a teacher with the Burlington County Special Services School District since 2002. In that time, he has worked with various populations of students, including those living with severe cognitive impairments, autism, and behavioral disabilities. Currently, Matt works as one of the school's work-based learning coordinators. In that role, he helps students acquire job skills and to find employment that both challenges the students and provides them with meaningful and fulfilling work experience utilizes technology to increase the student's independence at their work sites. Throughout Matt's career, he has been on numerous committees to help increase the use of functional technology at his school. He's created data-driven instruction and formative assessments by incorporating technology in the classroom. Matt has also completely digitized his program's data collection system, including the ability to provide instantaneous feedback on student progress. In addition to his work as a teacher, Matt also works as a kaiju novelist, and if you're not familiar, that is the giant monster genre, think Godzilla. His work can be found on Amazon and Audible. I myself am currently reading Chimera, Scourge of the Gods. I cannot possibly pass up a book that includes both giant monsters and applied behavior analysis. Matt has also used his love of technology and giant monster lore to help co-found the Kaiju vs. Cancer Charity in conjunction with St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital. The charity consists of a group of giant monster authors, artists, and YouTubers who put their original characters on shirts, into books, and games, all to help raise money for children battling cancer, which is pretty cool. So it's my great pleasure to hand off the presentation to Matt so we can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, that was a great introduction. Um, can you guys see both me and my screen at this point? Okay. I don't see you. Oh, let me try that again. Hold on. I do. Oh, you do? Okay. I do. All right, I'm going to go forward then. There we go. All right. Um, so thank you, everybody, for coming here tonight to hear me talk about assistive technology. Um, I know it is Shark Week, so uh, very tough to pull ourselves away from uh, the Discovery Channel, but I'm going to do my best to uh, hopefully show you guys some new technologies that you can utilize both in the classroom uh, and at home and for virtual instruction. I'm going to cover a wide range of 
technologies for uh, different needs, including uh, people with uh, reading issues, uh, people with communication issues. I'm going to try to cover different subjects like math, science, uh, even foreign language. So I'm going to go over all of these different points uh, throughout the presentation. So I hope that uh, you guys find this useful. Um, so as mentioned, what we're looking to do is reduce anxiety, uh, particularly with the use of technology. Um, I'm sure as students are gearing up to go back to school in whatever capacity uh, they're going to be going back, they're pretty anxious um, because they don't know what's going to happen. They don't know what's coming their way. So one way to reduce anxiety is to help people be aware of exactly what's expected of them. I'm sure uh, we would all feel the same if we're going into a position or a job. We want to know, for the most part, what's expected of us. Um, so one way that we can help out students is uh, through the use of uh, visual schedules. So I'm going to go through an app that can help with that. As I go through my presentation, uh, there'll be links to most things that I'm talking about. Uh, so if you can click on these uh, later on when this presentation is available for you, you can uh, go see exactly uh, the app I'm talking about, the website, or in some cases, it's just a link about more information for what we're talking about. So in this case, the link to the helpful counselor uh, can help with reducing school anxiety for children. It talks about some of the stuff I'm gonna cover here. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, visual schedules can be modified into specific steps known as a task analysis or a TA. So I utilize task analysis all the time uh, when I'm teaching and I work with students of all kinds of different functional levels and backgrounds and I find task analysis to be very helpful. I find that uh, my students find it to be very helpful. And because it's a breakdown of what the student's going to do, I often get feedback from them that it's reducing how anxious they are about engaging in a new task. Um, so as mentioned, the task analysis can be applied to a variety of techniques for identifying and understanding uh, the structures, flows, and attributes of a task. Um, it will identify the actions and cognitive process required for a user to achieve a particular goal. Uh, we utilize task analysis all the time, oftentimes uh, without realizing that we're doing it. So I'll just give you some quick examples of things that we do in our daily lives that require task analysis that have just kind of become part of our daily process. Uh, so here's some examples. If you've ever used directions, uh, often with pictures, to assemble an item such as a bookshelf that you got from Ikea or a bicycle, you've utilized the task analysis. Um, looking at directions on how to complete a new activity on a computer, which I'm going to go through at least one full task analysis today on how to utilize one of the apps that we're gonna highlight, uh, that would be an example. Uh, and it doesn't always have to be uh, written. Learning to drive a car is oftentimes completed by a task analysis. So when we all first sat down in a car for the first time, our instructor hopefully told us to make sure that we check our side view mirrors, check our rear view mirrors, put on our seat belt, go through the steps that's required to turn on a car and then to drive a car, look out the side view mirror before we turn into traffic, you know, those types of things. Um, recipes are excellent examples of task analysis. Uh, they tell us exactly what steps we have to take and they tell us exactly what measurements we need. Uh, so these are just all examples. And as you can see, like if you're doing any one of these things for the first time, you're gonna feel much less stressed out if you have the steps written out for you. Uh, if you're looking to explain this to your children or to your students, uh, a lot of times they'll use a task analysis to complete a walkthrough for a video game. So in particular, like a, a role-playing game, a, referred to as an RPG, uh, the students might download a walkthrough for how to get through the game. I know, for instance, uh, my daughters, we utilize these uh, walkthroughs, which again are like a task analysis, to complete like the Lego games because they have very specific games they have to go through. Uh, steps, rather. Uh, learning how to tie your shoes or uh, putting together Legos, that would also be examples of a task analysis. Um, the first app I'm going to go through is called the Ken Plan app. Uh, this is a free app on iPhone, uh, and this will be a visual schedule that we can put a task analysis into. Uh, as Christina mentioned, I currently work as a teacher 
as a work-based learning coordinator as well. So I place students in positions where they transition to the workforce. So I'm utilizing uh, this app uh, for multiple reasons. One is that it gives the students a step-by-step -step breakdown of what they need to complete at their job and the steps of how to complete it. But additionally, a lot of times uh, when I set a student up at a new work site, they will have a job coach with them. And now the job coach oftentimes will have to model what the student has to do. So for instance, if I have a student who needs to uh, do what's known as outdating or going through the shelves at a store and pulling out things which are past date, they might need to be shown how to do that at first. Now, in the era of COVID, I can't have a job coach standing six feet next to a student at all times. But with this app, I can set the entire activity up ahead of time with pictures, video, or text, or a combination of the three for the student to learn the activity. So the student can then look at this as a job coach stands six feet or more away and is basically there for questions while the student's looking at the app. I'm also going to show you some examples of how this can be utilized uh, for more traditional instruction, uh, for homework, um, or for even classwork if your students have access to things like iPads, uh, where I'm sure for a lot of us being six feet away from uh, students is going to be a key component as we go back to work. Uh, so as I mentioned, what is the Ken Plan app? It's a free app on iPhone uh, in which we can create a task analysis for a given set of tasks uh, that a student needs to complete. Uh, benefits. A uh, Ken Plan can increase independence at the workplace uh, or in this case, in any task that you're working on. As much as we can as teachers and as parents, we want uh, to see independence from our students so and our children. So if we can uh, set up an activity where they have a guide about what they're supposed to do instead of having us tell them, uh, it's a excellent way to go. In fact, um, fading out verbal instruction is the most difficult method to remove as far as scaffolding. So if we can take that part out after an initial description to the student of what to do and utilize technology like this, it can really help and decrease your independence. Um, and as you said, the workers will have complete access to the tasks they're completing or uh, their steps they're doing for uh, school instruction. I wasn't able to find uh, this app on Google or iPhone, uh, but uh, sorry, on Google or Kindle, but it is available on iPhone. And if I find something that's compatible or comparable, I will ask uh, Christine and Kelly if I can send them a new updated version of this presentation with those apps on there. So what I'm going to do is uh, show you a task analysis that I put together for how to use uh, the Ken Plan app. So just in case you haven't utilized the task analysis before, or it's a new system to you, this will give you an example of how to do that in addition to giving you step-by-step -step directions uh, for utilizing this app. I won't give you guys the full task analysis for each app that we look at um, because I'm sure you can all uh, get the idea for the process after seeing one, uh, but I will have like key information about how to utilize each app as we go through. Uh, so in this case, if I was uh, giving this to a teacher or to a student, or uh, as I've even given it to my daughters to use on their phones, um, the first step would be go to the app store and download the free Ken Plan app. And I just wanna point out, especially if a student's starting a new activity, in this case, and with technology for sure, uh, don't feel like any step um, is not important. That's not to say that you have to break down each step like I do here. If you're working with uh, students who are higher functioning and you can chunk several steps together, feel free to do so. Okay, in this case, I want my students to open up the app and click where it says all tasks in the top left-hand corner of the screen to view a to-do list. So this will be the list of things that they have to do. They would then click the plus sign at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen to add a new activity. I would suggest um, even if you're working with very high functioning students, it's not a bad idea to put in visual cues like this arrow I have here pointing to the plus sign. In particular for uh, new technology like this, uh, where uh, the plus sign doesn't really stick out all that much, even with me saying it's at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. 
So in this case, for the Kent Plan app, this will allow you to add a new task. Uh, you can give the task a name. In this case, I'm going to do a functional activity such as set table. I can also put a picture here if I wanted to. So where it says choose photo, I could have a picture of a table. So if I had a student who had a reading difficulty, they could just see the picture of the table being set and know that that's what they had to do. Once I have done that, oh, we can add steps to the task. Uh, now, this is where we can make a differentiation between a visual schedule and a full on uh, task analysis breakdown. So uh, we do have the ability to add steps here. And to do so, we just click add step. Uh, this is an example of adding steps. As I mentioned, uh, steps can be added with just text or with text and pictures uh, or even video from the phone if we need to. Um, in this case, uh, I could, took this picture of uh, trying to set the table. I'm not a good photographer, uh, but for the purposes of this um, activity, it would work. If I was doing this for an instructional piece, I would go back and try this again. Uh, but when we're done adding the text, we would just click done editing text in the top right hand corner of the screen. So over here, it was put down plate and I could click done editing text. We can now schedule the tasks. Um, to do this, we simply click on schedule this task. And again, um, with task analysis, it never hurts to put pictures and prompts in um, because some people do better with the visuals, some people do better uh, with just the words. Uh, so you can, if you're doing this for the first time for a student or for your child, I'd recommend utilizing text visual cues like the arrow and pictures. And then if you were able to determine that whoever you're making this for works better with only one of these types of instructions or with all three or a combination of two out of three, you modify from there. You have options to make this a repeat event or a one-time event. Uh, you can also schedule a day and time for the test to start. And you would do that using a uh, time of first reminder function. I feel like uh, doing the uh, repeat or one time is really important if you're planning to utilize this app uh, going forward in the school year. So for instance, I know a lot of students are going to be going back to school on a schedule where they're not going to be at school every day. So we can set this, these schedules up for the students to have, say, repeat going to school on Monday and Tuesday, that would be a very easy thing to put in. But then also set up a schedule where it's repeat to do the remote instruction on the days that they're not at school. I know a lot of districts are setting that up. Um, uh, for instance, I've been working with my daughters to set this up, whether it'll be at school Monday, Tuesday, we don't have their um, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday schedule yet, but when we do, I wanna make sure it's in their phones for them so that they know that, okay, it is uh, say nine o'clock on Thursday and I have math class right now. One um, issue that came up with the remote instruction for the second half of the school year was that teachers noticed a drop off of students attending classes that were set up online going forward. So if we could work to set something up like this in our students' phones or in our children's phones, it might be a way to help them stay on task to get to those virtual classes in particular. Um, as I said, you can also make it, it's a, a repeating event and it doesn't have to be on a daily basis. It can be weekly, monthly, um, or in my case, a lot of times I'll have to set this on weekends uh, or weekdays after school to coincide with my student's work schedule. So as you can see, that can make something daily, weekly, two times a week, monthly, um, weekdays, weekends, all over here. So the schedule can really be tailored to fit the student's needs or the worker's needs, um, or even I myself utilize this, like I had put on here um, when I had meetings to get ready for this presentation and this presentation itself, just so I didn't forget to utilize it or to be ready for it. Once you have finished scheduling your task, you just click save on the top right-hand corner of the screen. 
So as you can see here, we have set table ready to go with a better picture. And I put down the first two steps uh, to be done here. So put down plate and then next place fork. Uh, so we have just the plate, then the plate and the fork. I could add more steps if I wanted to, but I felt for the purposes of uh, this presentation that you guys would get the idea. Uh, I was also able to schedule it for a certain time. So in this case, it was for June 17th, 2020 at 9.15 a.m. After saving your task, you'll now see it as part of your all tasks list. So uh, this is the all tasks list up here. And next we're going to to-do list. I just didn't want to cover that up, but this is showing you that all tasks is currently open here. You're going to hit the plus sign to enter more tasks if you wanted to. So if I wanted the student to uh, in this case, uh, this was set up for activities uh, that a student might do at home as part of a functional living program. They might set the table, then sweep the floor, then load the dishwasher. So we could put all of those activities in here. We would simply continue adding steps or adding tasks until we had set up the schedule for the entire day. Once we have set up the task, we're gonna click on the to-do list now icon in the top left-hand corner of the page or in this case of your screen. Uh, this will take you to your all tasks. Uh, this showing you all the tasks you have to complete for a given day. Uh, so in this case, that's when I was first utilizing this, I put in here to work on a computer and set the table. I like to multitask, so I set them for the same time. Uh, but we could go in and edit that if we had wanted to. When you're at your all tasks, you can just click on the first task for the day to start that activity. You'll now be shown the task you need to complete. You can click on this speak down here to have the words uh, sent to you. Just as a quick side note, so when setting up a task analysis, I made sure to put this icon in here because again, and this visual prompt because this speak is not very big for the first time as you guys are looking at this. So as part of my task analysis, I want to make sure that I'm highlighting these important things for you guys. If you're just doing the schedule, if you only have the task itself to do, uh, you can click done at the type right hand corner of the screen once you have completed the task. So in this case, the student didn't need a task analysis, just needed like a schedule to say that, oh, I had to set the table. So we just click done in the top right hand corner when he or she has done that activity. If you decide that a task analysis is gonna be a better way for you to get this task across or this instruction, and you have it broken down into steps, you can click done at each completed step. So we put down the plate in this case, uh, we could click done and then move on and put down the fork and click done and move on. Uh, when you reach the last step, the program will prompt you that the task is completed. So in this case, we got through all the steps and it would say end of task. Once the task is done, you'll return to your all task screen. Here you'll see a green check mark over here on uh, the activity that you've completed so that the student will know that, hey, I've completed set the table. Now I can go to work on computer. Um, in this case, like I set this up where I wanted to start from the bottom and work up, but you can also have the student go from the top and work down or just kind of uh, have a scattered activity. So if they had like four or five activities, they could complete it in whichever order was best for them. When opening the app after the initial use, so once you have set up uh, at least your first schedule, uh, you can click show today for today's schedule or use the arrows to look at past or upcoming schedules. Uh, this is obviously very helpful. We don't want to necessarily open up to whatever the last thing we worked on was. We want students to open this up and see what they have to do today. Uh, although I do find it helpful to use these two little arrows here to be able to go back and forth between uh, schedules in case if a student needs to double check what they did yesterday in case they missed something for whatever reason, or simply to see what was on their schedule the previous day. You can click on all tasks to return to your to-do list. Here you can use edit, add and modify or delete tasks so you can if you decide that you need to have a full task analysis for your first activity, 
and you only have a schedule, you can go in and put those steps in to make it a full task analysis. You can modify if you want to switch around the tasks or just delete tasks if it's a task that's no longer being worked on. So um, as I mentioned, that was an example of using the Can Plan app to complete a functional living activity. But here's an example of using Can Plan app to help with homework. And this is a very easy to use app once you start. Like this entire homework um, schedule I have put together in less than five minutes after only utilizing the app for a few minutes. Uh, so as you can see here, first the student is going to do their homework. This is just an image that I pulled off the internet. So I just did a quick search, saved it in my phone under my pictures for homework, and then was able to upload it onto the app. Uh, next, I want the students to do their math homework. Again, just a simple math image pulled from the internet. Uh, following that, the student's going to do their spelling homework. Uh, very important, uh, especially with the amount of virtual instruction or at home instruction that we're going to be doing uh, as teachers and as parents too, to make sure that we schedule breaks for our students no matter what level they're at. Um, you know, the burnout rate can be high and we don't want to forget part of the anxiety uh, that our students will be experiencing is not having that few minutes in between switching activities or switching classes to talk to their friends or take your breather or whatever. So don't feel bad about putting, uh, you know, take a 15 minute break in there, um, especially if it's activities the students are completing independently. Uh, then we have the student come back to do their reading homework, to do their science homework, and then they have come to the end of the task. So that was an example of just having a schedule, but I could have put a task analysis in there if it was needed. So uh, like, let's say if I go back to science and I was having the students complete um, the very basic, uh, like make an at-home lava lamp with oil and Alka-Seltzer and some food coloring. I could put each step in there that I want the students to complete for how to do the activity. Um, I did utilize this with my students as we went to at-home instruction, including putting in like some of these task analysis steps. And I've got good feedback, not just from the students, but from the parents as well, uh, because um, you know the parents weren't always sure exactly how to complete these activities. Uh, even myself, um, you know, my oldest daughter is uh, going into middle school, so it's hard for me to remember some of the math she's doing sometimes. So had I had a uh, kind of a breakdown step by step, or she did, it would have been really helpful to have us complete those activities. Um, just want to talk a little bit more about task analysis, especially in regards to technology, uh, because it's such a useful way uh, to teach technology and to assess it. Uh, so it can be used as a formative assessment with instantaneous feedback. So typically in school, a lot of times we'll utilize what's known as a summative assessment, uh, in which that means we'll give instruction and then we will have a quiz or a test where we see like, how did the students do after giving this instruction? Formative assessment, which is what a test analysis is, is completed as the student is doing the activity. So I could be looking at the student doing the activity and using my task analysis to gauge how well they did on that activity. Were they able to do each step independently? Did they need my help? Did they figure out a way to complete it by referring to their notes? Um, you know, all good information we can get from that. Uh, we also would have instantaneous feedback. Uh, so one of the biggest things that can cause anxiety for students is not getting the feedback. Uh, I'm sure any teacher here has been asked when they're going to get a test back or when a student will know how they did on a project. If we're using a formative assessment like a test analysis, we can tell the students how they uh, were doing on a project as they're doing the project. So the feedback's instantaneous. Um, quick feedback, again, it can help to improve performance because we're modifying what we're doing as the student's doing it and instruction. And again, reduce anxiety. The student knows you're gonna get quick feedback. They know that if they had difficulty with a step in the task, that we're there to help them or somebody's there to help them, or we have technology there to help them as they're going through. Task analysis 
also allows for inter-reader reliability, which can lead to better instruction and confidence building. So uh, as for instance, let's say if we're having a student complete a task uh, and we're, it's the same activity at school on Monday, Tuesday, and at home on Thursday, Friday, I as a teacher can score how the student does. And then I can ask the parent or sibling of the student to score the same activity utilizing the same task analysis. Um, and if the two of us are pretty close to how we're seeing the student perform, then we'll know that instruction seems to be going pretty well uh, and that it's consistent in generalization from school to home. If there is a difference, difference between my score and the parent's score, one way or the other, then we can say like, well, what's the difference here? Is the student doing better at home because maybe they're more confident at home or maybe there's something in the environment that we're not aware of that's helping the student out. Uh, so for instance, if we are working with say like a kindergartner who was working on colors and mom or dad didn't realize that they had a color chart up on the refrigerator, but when the student was working there, they were able to utilize that to get their colors, but they couldn't do it at home, at school, because we didn't have that color chart up. Um, those are the types of things that we can find out from utilizing a task analysis. Task analysis can also be used as a functional self-assessment. So um, a lot of us probably do this all the time. When we're doing activity, we'll kind of be seeing how we did on each step of the activity. And then we can see like, am I doing well with this? Am I not doing well with this? and then change as we're going. Um, it'll, it's an excellent skill. I will often have my students who I put at work sites, for instance, try to assess themselves because we're not always gonna have a job coach there for them. They're gonna be able to have to work independently to complete whatever their job is. Or conversely, if you're teaching in a classroom, you're not always gonna be there with the student. Again, in this new world that we're in, you might not have your student every day. So we want the student to be able to assess themselves and see where that they are not so strong at so they need extra help. And additionally, where they are strong at because uh, it can build confidence in what they're doing. Uh, this is an example of a task analysis that I had utilized this summer. Uh, so what I did is I gave all of my students um, a list of activities that they could complete at work sites that I know I had set up. And I put it into a Google Doc um, with the Google Sheets with pre-programmed formulas in to help the students track their progress. So in this case, uh, it was like, say there are going to be blocking items on the shelf from to the front of a shelf in orderly manner or reorder shelves with similar materials placed together. Uh, the students were to score themselves uh, with a two if they were able to do the task by themselves, or a one if they needed help, uh, or they could also give themselves an NA if it wasn't available. Uh, so in this case, these are not real student scores. I just put these in. But by making this in Google Docs and then sharing a copy with each student, I was able to see how they were doing on these activities each day, and the student was able to see how they were doing on the activity as well, um, because their average score using the pre-programmed formula would show them how they were going up or down in their ability to complete the task. So um, I, I can't emphasize enough how helpful Google Classroom can be. I'm sure many of you are familiar with that, but if we can set up activities where um, students are assessing themselves through something like this, I uh, find it extremely helpful. Not only are we helping to include parents and students into the assessment process, uh, we're giving the students some ownership over what you're doing through the technology that we're utilizing. And uh, like from our perspective, when it comes time to do grades, it's very easy to look and say like, oh, this is how I saw the student doing. This is how mom or dad saw the student doing. This is how they themselves saw the student doing and average a score from there. Or have plenty of data to support exactly where the student is. And again, review generalization from there. Um, Next, I'll be going over a bunch of different apps for a bunch of different age levels, as well as for different uh, instructional uh, classes. So I know we talked a lot about what to do with anxiety. So if you have younger students or younger children, Breathe, Think, Do with Sesame is a very good anxiety reducing app. Um, so in case this comes up in a blog questions, I already talked about with Christine, I have no idea who this Sesame Street monster is. So um, if anybody knows and can post it, I'd greatly appreciate it. 
Um, but this is another free app. It teaches students how to plan out events, problem solve, uh, stay persistent and learn self-control. And again, all these apps are linked here. Uh, so this app helps young students by breaking down and dealing with anxiety um, from a task analysis perspective. And it's not gonna say it's a task analysis, but it's a task analysis. Uh, so in this case, uh, it's interactive for the students and also works a bit like a game. So especially for younger children, uh, this can be fun. So as seen here and written directions, they would simply tap on the monster to calm him down if they indicated they're feeling stressed. Um, they would then do kind of a fun little game to pop these bubbles. And depending on how the monster was feeling and what options uh, we decided to put in there as parents or educators, it could give the students some plans to help deal with their stress. So for instance, uh, maybe this, this guy needs to calm down. We're gonna pop these bubbles. And these would all, they do have a key to say what these activities are in the app. So it might be like, oh, the student can go for a walk. Maybe the students need to sit down and take a few deep breaths. Maybe the student just needs some quiet time, but all different choices that can be used to deal with anxiety. They also do have examples in there for like anger or sadness too, depending you know, on what the student is dealing with. Uh, this I found a very helpful app uh, for all age levels, the Calm Meditation and Sleep app. So I know that for myself, for my daughters, for my students, uh, that as we've been in this new age of virtual instruction, that my sleep pattern and all of their sleep patterns has been all over the place. Uh, so people have been staying up later, it's harder to get up on time, our sleep patterns are just a mess. This is an app that can really help out with those uh, issues in multiple ways. So as a teacher, I have recommended this to my students as well, especially if they say to me like, you know, Mr. Denyan, I've really been having trouble uh, getting to sleep, so I'm, I'm not able to wake up and make it to your class on time. Or it, it, an even bigger issue for me would be like, if my students are having difficulty with their sleep patterns and making it to work on time, then I really wanna do whatever I can to help them out to get their sleep patterns back in check. So this app, the Calm app, offers different forms of um, meditation to help with anxiety, depression, and insomnia. So I'm not going to go through the entire app like I did for the Ken Plan app, um, because you guys now have that method of how to break things down. But this is just an example of some of the things that the app can do. Uh, so I want to show you like how to meditate, if uh, meditating is something that you feel would be helpful for you, your child, or your student, um, easing depression, anxiety release. So these will do things um, like the anxiety release one, I found extremely helpful for students going in for a presentation or for a job interview, where one of the things that we talk about here is taking a deep breath for five seconds in, and then a deep breath for five seconds out. And uh, what that does is to help slow down some of our cognitive processes uh, so that if we are going to speak and we will make sure we're not speaking too fast, it's a good thing to do uh, before that occurs. So like I myself, before giving this presentation, try this to make sure I'm not speaking too fast. Conversely, it also helps us to focus. So if you have a student who you know is going to have to give a presentation, uh, like a virtual presentation for a uh, social studies project, let's say, if they were use this ahead of time to do that deep breathing, it helps focus their thoughts so that they can speak more clearly and more easily. Um, and then for the sleep part, they have these um, sleep stories, which are just uh, different stories that they will go over uh, with a narrator and some background music. Uh, for me, for instance, uh, I found a while ago that when I have trouble sleeping, if I put on the History Channel, the narrator there, uh, his voice is very soothing and helps me to go to sleep, uh, but then I'd have to wake up and turn off my TV later. In this case, as you can see, for instance, they have this exploring Easter Island um, video that can be watched. So it is uh, it is cool too, because you can also learn as you're doing it. So you can learn about Easter Island as it's helping you to fall asleep, uh, or you can listen to and learn about a waterfall or nightfall or whatever the case might be. So I highly recommend it app. Stop, Breathe, and Think app. Uh, this is a free app 
that gives students the ability to identify and process their emotions. Uh, a lot of these apps, and this is a good one for this, also reinforces children by giving them rewards for activities uh, successfully completed. So I'm sure you all have students or children yourself that are playing all kinds of mobile games like uh, uh, my kids play Pokemon Go. So uh, the more that they play the uh, game, the more rewards they get for playing the game. Uh, these apps will give them rewards too. So it, it does help to be a bit more reinforcing, a little bit of applied behavior analysis in there. So the student does the activity, they get reinforced for doing the activity in addition to learning the skill. Uh, so I love whenever we can tie those types of things into technology. Uh, so here's an example. This is again for younger students. We will get to some stuff for older students uh, soon. But this is a step-by-step -step task analysis for how to deal with emotions. Uh, so in this case, the students have a variety of emotions in the form of faces. You might often see something similar to this in a doctor's office or a pediatrician's office, where it might say like my pain level is a one where the person's kind of smiling all the way to a 10 where they're like screaming. Uh, but in this case, it's like, does the person feel overly happy? Are they laughing hysterically? Are they calm? Are they anxious? Are they worried? Are they sad or are they angry? So once the student picks how they feel, they'll get a short video about what they can do for that activity. Uh, so in this case, this student feel happy, felt happy. Uh, so this video is just kind of showing them that, oh, well, if you're happy and we've got a few minutes, um, we can just kind of sit down and enjoy it. And if they're able to do that, then they get like a new little sticker over here would be the reward. And then they can build up stickers as they go. Uh, Smiling Mind app, this is for ages seven to 18. So I did wanna make sure we hit like our high school students. Uh, so this is another free app. It's for middle school and high school students, uh, even for adults. It offers methods to deal with stress and social pressure. Um, so a lot of anxiety comes from social pressure. Um, Again, in this new age we're in, um, students don't have a lot of the social uh, releases they would typically have for anxiety. They're not able to participate in sports the way they used to. They're not able to interact with their friends the way they had used to. So um, I did find this app to be helpful in dealing with those things. Uh, they've even had like a few new suggestions updated into this app uh, for like the COVID-19 world that we now live in. Uh, so here's just an example of what you can see on this app. So start your mindfulness journey today. And as you can see, uh, they have different types of programs, adults, kids and youth, families, classroom, at work, um, even for other languages. I've used the at work one uh, for some of my students I place at work. Um, I've used the family one because uh, my family uh, has been driving me nuts to some extent over the past few months. I'm sure I'm driving them nuts. So uh, there's different suggestions in here for how to deal with your family at home and to be aware of yourself. So like it's helped me to become more aware of things that I'm doing to increase the anxiety of my daughters as we've all been stuck at home the past few months. Um, as you can say, it's, see, it's only like a 10 minute a day thing. And similar to the Ken Plan app, you can set up reminders uh, for yourself. I didn't find this app to be as in depth in terms of like uh, making a visual schedule or a um, task analysis for instructional purposes as the can plan app however for social skills and dealing with anxiety um, dealing with social stress i found this app to be better than the can plan app for meeting those needs um, i want to cover a few apps to help out with dyslexia um, with all that's going on in the world today, it is obviously very stressful anytime we turn on the news for um, both us and our students and our children. And uh, one way to reduce anxiety and to be engaged in the community is to utilize this Pocket app. So what the Pocket app is, it's a free app where you can pick uh, different types of topics that you'd like to pop up in your news feed every day. And what I really like about the Pocket app is that it doesn't really skew things uh, to the left or the right in terms of news. It's basically uh, just the facts. So uh, for instance, today in my pocket app uh, came up that uh, Kamala Harris is uh, gonna be uh, Joe Biden's vice president pick. So what the pocket app did was just basically show me um, information on what Kamala Harris has done without like 
um, any uh, input from people who are skewed one way or the other. Uh, so far, students that can be extremely helpful where it's just information based. Um, it's also good for social skills, again, for students uh, that I place at work. So especially if I place like a student with autism at work, um, they might have difficulty with the soft skills at work, like when they are in a lunchroom or when they're on a break as far as engaging with their fellow co-workers. Um, so one thing that we might all talk about is what's going on in the world and, and news. So I have the students kind of like utilize this just so they have a basic understanding of what's going on, not just in terms of politics, as well as we'll cover things like the COVID issue that we're currently having, or um, a few weeks ago, um, there was a lot on the social movements going on so that the students that uh, were at work uh, were able to engage in conversations with their co-workers on those things if it was to come up. Um, Pocket app was kind enough to put a task analysis into their app. So I'll just uh, go through this. Um, see right now, when you first open up, your list is empty. You can learn how to put what you are looking for or what you want your student or child to look for into the app. Um, and then you just follow the instructions in the app. So uh, you can enable it to save from Safari or Twitter or Flipboard, whatever you decide. But the default, again, is uh, basically just straight up newsfeed. Um, you can copy URLs if you want to look at something later. I'm not going to read this whole thing to you guys. Again, you can go back and look at it later if you want to. Um, and again, you just continue to follow the instructions in the app. Um, you can copy URL to your clipboard, you can share it. Um, if you want your students to discuss uh, a certain news topic, you can have like a small group put together and say, student A, I want you to find a topic, uh, read it, talk about it with student B, send it to student B, then student B is going to take that same information and re-represent it to student C maybe, for instance, just as a like, uh, making sure the students know what you're looking at and reading it down the line as you watch them online or whatever the case might be. Um, in this case, you just find an article you want and click on it. This does also have the ability to read the article to the students, which again, super helpful for any students with any sort of reading issue. Um, I made sure to highlight this one about how they got all 12 kids paid for college because I'm struggling with two. Uh, and I'm sure so anybody else out there with kids who's thinking about college, maybe check this article out. Um, and then we can listen to the article. So if we had the app open, we could listen to the article, which is good. So not only uh, can students uh, read the article, but if uh, they're going on the bus and they want to listen to something they can, or if they're just walking or whatever, they can listen to the article. One thing I found very helpful uh, for students um, facing the stress of high school level uh, research papers is this site and app. Uh, so I have worked with students who are taking college courses right now, and they were very stressed by having to do research papers because research papers is uh, something that it's difficult to do. And uh, you know, a lot of us have had to do that, but citations can be the most difficult part uh, to make sure that we properly cite our work because we wanna make sure that our students aren't improperly citing or plagiarizing work. Uh, so in this case, using CiteIn, which is uh, not an app, it's a website, can generate a proper citation in APA, MLA, or even Chicago style. Uh, to utilize this website, you would just go to uh, the website, enter the information into the proper categories um, and choose what style you're looking for, APA, MLA, or Chicago. So in this case, I put the name in of an author, uh, the title, year of publication, place of publication, and the publisher. And, and here's the citation, easy as that. Uh, so this was uh, Denny and Matthew, 2015, Chimera, Scourge of the Gods, New Zealand, Severed Press. And this is what my in-text citation should look like. So give this a bibliography and the in-text citation. Uh, so I was going to put a shameless plug for my own book in here, um, but Christine did a much better job of it than I could. So um, there it is, and we'll just move on from there. These are some apps that I've utilized for students with uh, dysgraphia. And uh, even more so than me, I've worked with many a speech therapist and even more so occupational therapist who have really found success with these two apps. One is Wet Dry Try, which is available for iPad and Android, and the other is Snapatype, which is available for iPad. 
Uh, so wet, dry, try, this program allows students to work on making letters, numbers, and signs with their fingers first. Uh, the program prevents reversals by having a smiley face in the corner of the screen, which will smile as long as the student is making a letter or number in the correct orientation. Um, once the students stop doing that, it won't smile anymore, so they know that they have to go back and self-correct. Um, additionally, once a student masters creating a target with their fingers, they're then encouraged to try the same target with a stylus. So it's a good scaffolding system where we go from fingers to using a stylus and then hopefully transfer that over to paper. Uh, SnapType, uh, this app allows students to take a photo of a worksheet. They can then tap on the screen where they need to add text. Uh, once they tap on an the area, they can either type in their answers or use their fingers to write in answers. And once the worksheet is complete, uh, the student will be able to print out the worksheet with the answers on it. So again, this can be very helpful uh, for students during this time of remote instruction. So we could take a photo of a worksheet, send it to the students or send the students the worksheet and they can take a photo. And then utilizing uh, this app, they can type in their answers or use their fingers to write in the answers and then get a printed worksheet to send back to us. Um, these are some apps for outdoor and in-home instruction. Again, I know a lot of anxiety is coming from how are we as uh, teacher is going to be able to fill all the time for our students, especially when they're not going to be in the classroom the whole time. These are some apps that I found useful for different methods of instruction that are easy to use um, outdoors or at home. So even too, if we're in a classroom where um, I know in my school it's been recommended if we can to plan some outdoor activities uh, because it reduces the um, chances of passing on COVID. So if you're a teacher who can utilize some of these apps outside and you have the ability to do so, this might be something that can help you out. Uh, the first one is for math instruction and it's called Air Measure. It's an app that allows students to use their phones to take measurements of objects and areas around them. This is a fantastic app for learning area and perimeter as well as showing practical applications for those skills. So. I've utilized this for students where I've given the assignment to go home, and um, this is a great example right here, to find the area of a room in their house. So what they do is they take their phone, they point at one corner, and then they click, drag the phone over to the next corner, click again, and it makes the first line for them. They then click again, take this to the next corner, and complete that for the entire room, and then it'll give the students what the area and perimeter of the room is. You can also show them how it's a practical application for things like hanging a picture. So I wanna make sure that this picture that I'm hanging on my wall is in the dead center of my wall. How do I do that? Well, I can utilize this app to determine exactly where that would be. What's the midpoint of this wall? Um, you can also use it for things uh, like measuring a person's height, um, stuff like that. So just an excellent um, math app that can be utilized. Uh, PlantNet is a really fun app. Uh, this app allows the students to take pictures of the various plants in their community and then identify what type of plants they have uh, photographed. So if you're a science teacher and you want to incorporate um, what kind of plants are in this the, around the student's house and you want to get them up and moving some and outside, uh, this is a great activity or if you can go outside your classroom and take pictures this is great it'll also tell you if plants aren't supposed to be there for instance um, luckily one of my neighbors had planted bamboo which for people who don't know is extremely invasive so when we took a picture with plant net of the bamboo it came up that it was not native to this community and gave information about how bamboo is an invasive species that can actually push out native plants so it's a very good science app I had found. Starwalk is a very interesting app um, for science teachers again, and this can also give you some cross content. Uh, so what Starwalk is, is you take an app and you just point it into the night sky and it'll show you what's up there. It'll show you what constellations you're looking at. Um, it can show you if there are neat things in the sky that night, like the planet, um, Venus, for instance, or if there was a um, 
satellite or space station overhead. And then there's uh, the cross content is great here. So for instance, my daughters and I, uh, we happened to see cancer when it was out this crab and we didn't know what cancer was. So it was a great opportunity then to use this app to explain what cancer is in the sky. So it turns out that uh, cancer is a crab related to the legend of Hercules where um, he was fighting the Hydra and apparently Hera sent this crab to go try to stop him from defeating the Hydra. Uh, so just a, a neat little cross there with like mythology teaching in addition to the astronomy. It also presented an excellent opportunity. Um, for instance, when one time it indicated a satellite was going overhead and it was much brighter than the other stars in the sky and you could see it moving. Uh, so it was, it was an excellent opportunity for my daughters and I to talk about critical thinking skills and say, for instance, like, oh, wow, um, you know, I know there's like an increased report of unidentified flying objects sometimes when satellites happen to come into view. And well, now I can see why people might think that because if you just look up in the sky and you see something really bright that's moving kind of against the clouds and you know it's not an airplane, um, that's why people could be confused. But if we were to utilize a research method like this app, we could see, oh, it's nothing uh, out of the ordinary. It's just a satellite that's up in the sky. Uh, Times Tables Rockstars, another great math app. Uh, so this is an app that has students work through games to learn their timetables and it gives them rewards as they progress, uh, mainly to customize their rock star here. Um, so my daughters love this. Um, they're in uh, going into second grade and sixth grade. So I had my older daughter use it previously, my younger daughter now, but they love being able to do their time table if they're learning it, but then the reinforcement that applied behavior analysis component of being able to modify their rock star. They get a bandana, they get a new guitar, you can get like a saxophone, um, different clothes, whatever. Again, it's just reinforcing them doing these activities. And then for any foreign language teachers we have, I found Duolingo is an excellent language learning app. It teaches and reinforces numerous languages. Um, Spanish, French, German, just to name a few. I've actually been utilizing this myself where um, um, my neighbors on either side of me uh, speak mainly Portuguese. So I've been using this app a little bit uh, just so I can converse with them and, and try to learn a little bit about them and their language. And then it opens up a nice door where they're, um, you know, they'll talk to me some more and help me out to learn the language. So it's been very good for that. Um, this also works like a video game. So again, um, with some of that applied behavior analysis and reinforcement mixed into it, where you start out with so many like hearts or lives, like a student would in a video game. And if they happen to lose those five hearts, they're done for the day of shut down. Uh, but they would pick up exactly where they had left off at for that day on the following day. So I do like that component where again, a lot of our children and students are used to this format from playing games. So if we can carry that over and embed it into instruction, um, it's just a very good thing. So a quick review, visual schedules in the form of test analysis can be used to reduce anxiety by allowing students to see what's expected of them and how to complete a task. Uh, the Can Plan app is an app will, to allow you to create a visual schedule and a task analysis utilizing pictures, video, and audio for students with reading issues. Pocket will help students with reading issues by giving them access to print media in an audio format and stay aware of current events. Um, for students with reading issues on the high school and college level, the Cited In website can really help with citations. Wet, dry, try can help students with dysgraphia to learn to make letters and numbers. And Snap Type can help students with dysgraphia. Uh, so that is it for me. Uh, unless you guys have any questions. I'm not sure how to uh, turn this back over to you, Christine, if you know what I have to click. Here. Um, I, I do. Oh, it's a good thing. <laughs> Kelly will grab, he'll, she'll grab control of, uh, oh, okay. of the screen. <laughs> Thanks. But uh, yeah, thank you so much, Matt. That was awesome. And we have gotten a number of questions. So let's see if we can get to sure. a few. It's getting a little bit late, so we'll get to as many as we can. Real quick, important update. Apparently, the Sesame Street monster is simply Blue Monster. Thank you for the dedicated oh, um, webinar <laughs> attendee who gave us that information. So the first question was regarding potentially using an alternative visual calendar that's not on a device. So is that something, are there any downsides to using something that is not on a device or particular challenges with using the device? Any thoughts on that? 
Uh, so I'm not sure I understand the question. We're talking about using a calendar that's just like a, a paper-based calendar or a laminate one, or we're talking about taking a calendar um, that is like that and putting it into the device. Um, I think we're looking at something that is not on the device at all. So are no. there kind of comparing and contrasting using a device versus not a device? That totally depends on the student. That's an excellent question. So you always want to go with whatever the student is most comfortable with. Uh, so if the student or child is more comfortable with something that's not technology based, then definitely go with something that's not technology based. If you find your student or child has an aptitude for technology and it's reinforcing for them, then utilize that one. So it's, a, it's certainly a case by case basis. Great. So um, another question is regarding the formative assessment and wondering if that ever causes anxiety in and of itself in certain students. It can at first if you don't explain to them what you are doing. So for instance, if uh, I'm just standing next to a student, uh, I'll use myself as an example at a work site. So if I don't tell the student when I go out to do a work site visitation uh, that I'm scoring them and that I'm not only scoring them uh, to get an assessment, but to help them out, it can cause stress. If I'm just standing there quietly and checking off numbers as I go, if uh, before they go out or before I start the assessment, I explain to them like, hey, I'm here. What I'm going to be doing is checking off how you do on each step in this activity. If you need help, I'll be here to help you out. And then we'll also know where you need help at. So, um, that way I can go back later and help you out with this. Also the key part about formative assessments is uh, they're typically performed at a much higher frequency than a summative assessment. And that's important for students to understand as well. So for instance, if we do an informed assessment on day one, I might come back two or three days later and perform that same formative assessment and then get um, an average score from those assessments or typically actually I'd usually do like more like a month's worth of uh, assessments and then take that score. But if I let the student know that ahead of time, it usually helps to reduce anxiety, but it's like anything. If we explain to the students ahead of time what we're doing and why we're doing it, it seems to help reduce anxiety. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, we had another interesting question uh, regarding assistive technology for folks with dyslexia. Uh, sure. Wondering about students that have dyslexia and also have tics that might cause them some problems when they're reading. So for example, if a child has a tic that causes them to jump lines or have to read words and lines over again, um, other than the pocket app that you went over, is there anything else you can think of that might be able to help a student like that? Um, as far as for like an app that helps to uh, read ahead of time. Um, well, there is some basic ones like Audible, uh, which is available from Amazon. So uh, I'll use an older example uh, an older student example here. If a student has like a textbook that uh, they're studying for uh, a college course or, or a high level high school course, you might be able to purchase that app on Audible. Uh, what I can do though is I'll, I'll see if I can find any more apps and put them into the blog later going forward or websites or whatever we can find. Great, appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, so another question about wondering if there are any particular challenges when you're using mobile technology with students in the classroom. Is it ever um, a distraction or is it, are there any other challenges that come up? That's an excellent question. Uh, so I've been utilizing mobile technology now with my class for the past four years. Uh, so it's like any class, we want to establish rules ahead of time. So uh, some of those rules would be things like, uh, we're gonna utilize this for instructional purposes, obviously not uh, for games. And then, or for social media would be a, you know, a very good example of an issue that could come up. Um, so that would be the type of thing we establish ahead of time that look, if you are going to not utilize this correctly, there's going to be consequences, which may include like you're no longer able to use that technology or um, you have to do some other form of instruction. So for instance, um, again, I, I can use myself as an example. Uh, when I'm using the Ken Plan app and having a student utilize it as a work site, I really have to emphasize ahead of time that we're not utilizing this when you're on a job uh, to look up your Twitter feed. You know, this is for you to utilize to complete steps. And uh, like in that case, I would give the employer a uh, heads up too that, hey, they're utilizing this technology for instructional purposes. If I was in the classroom, I am constantly moving around the classroom to check to make sure that students are utilizing technology properly and not for 
um, activities that it's not required for. If you have the right school too, you can get something uh, where like it limits what they're able to do. For instance, at uh, my school, we will have Kindles, which only have very basic access. Um, but again, that's something you have to work out with an administrator um, ahead of time. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, that's always a problem with anything new. We introduce technology. Um, in particular, and unfortunately, the students usually know more about it than we do as a teacher. So uh, it's always trying to keep up with them in that respect. Great. Thank you. So another question that came up is a very interesting one. So they're kind of wondering if we're using all these different technologies to help children um, so that they don't necessarily have to type if there's handwriting, handwriting issues um, or you know, listening aloud versus reading. You know, do you see any challenges they might have to face when they're adults, when they may have to use some of these skills? Uh, so for instance, if we're teaching them to handwrite as opposed to type, um, there, there can be challenges. That's a very good question. Um, but there's, there's modifications to get around that. Um, so for instance, um, I have a, a very good friend who's a fellow writer like me, and he has Asperger's syndrome. Um, so he will sometimes have difficulty focusing when he's trying to uh, type because he has to think about the story he's writing as well as uh, keep on what he is typing out. So for him, he has utilized uh, the program, I want to say it's Dragonfly, where he can speak and uh, his computer will type for him. So um, yes, it's another good question. I do think that there can be issues going forward, but there can be workarounds for it as well. I also think, um, I mean, how much do we see in the past few months where technology has become such a bigger part of um, society in general for schools, for work, for whatever, that there's new things that we can utilize to hopefully meet the needs of the majority of people going forward. So if uh, the typing skill is, uh, is not taught, then we can use like a um, text, uh, speech to text rather, uh, application to help fill that hole as just one for instance. Great. So I think we have time for one more question. So sure. we have someone who's wondering if you have any suggestions or experiences with uh, the collaboration aspect between families and teachers. So if parents at home are interested in utilizing some of these technologies in the class experience, how do they work with the teacher or how if the teacher on the other end is the one who wants to introduce some of these technologies, how do they kind of work with the parents so that they're all on the same page? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so what I found is that I have utilized uh, several of these apps, the Can Plan app, for instance, I utilize this summer. Um, I gave the example of utilizing that Google Sheets to do the task analysis. Um, also this past summer, I had my students do things like utilize an online database to sell back uh, books that they had at home. Um, I had them utilize um, uh, multiple databases for filling out job application. But uh, in order to make sure that the parents are involved, uh, one thing that helps out is extremely detailed test analysis like the Ken Plan app one that I had uh, showed you guys at first. Uh, if the parent has that, it's very helpful for them to follow the step-by-step -step instructions. Also with uh, Google Classroom, is that I basically set up two classrooms, one for um, my students and one where I could have uh, parents participate as well, just in terms of like viewing. So when I was doing initial instruction, uh, the parents were able to sit there and look at what I was showing the students as well. Um, and then, um, jump in with any questions they had. In my case, I do work um, with students in this, this summer. I had students with behavioral disabilities and learning disabilities. Uh, so it was helpful to have, especially for the students with the learning disabilities, uh, the parents sit there and see what I'm showing the students, uh, how to complete the activity, and then again, send them like a detailed uh, task analysis with visuals if need be to um, complete the activity. Oh, and uh, also like that, uh, the Google Docs was very helpful in terms of, again, like the inner reader reliability. Uh, so what I would do is set up like multiple tabs uh, for that, or is it Google Sheets actually? For the Google Sheets, I'd set up multiple tabs, one for myself, one for the student, one for the parent, uh, so that I was able to see 
um, what they were reporting as well, and then set up a conference if we needed to, if there was uh, like a large difference between um, how I saw the student progressing when I was doing virtual instruction and how the parent saw the student progressing or the students themselves saw themselves progressing uh, as they completed the activity. Great. So I said that was the last question, but you know, I just want to backtrack one because I did have kind of a follow-up or a clarifying question on one sure. of the previous questions where we were kind of discussing moving forward out of the school setting. Um, and if we're using all these different technologies now, how will that affect them as an adult? So just I'm just gonna read directly as this person wrote it. So the question is around will these students face issues as adults or is what we're teaching them using these technologies is it usable as adults yes uh definitely i think so a, a lot of the technologies that i had cited um either using with students who are technically postgraduate uh because they're 18 to uh 21 and in a transition program or i myself would utilize them um <laughs> so i found like the um uh the ken plan and pocket apps to be uh very helpful apps for me or um, like I had mentioned the uh, the meditation app is a very functional app I think it's extremely important uh, with any new technology we're introducing to think how is this going to be functional we don't just want it to be a bridge because we're not able to see the students in person as much as we want we want it to be a functional skill uh, that the student is learning so if we can have that technology um, be a functional skill we can have it transition to work or to college or to social skills, um, then yes, it can absolutely be utilized um, as adults going forward. Great, thank you. And I just, you know, I got a couple of comments regarding the app you mentioned, um, whether you were speaking about the Dragonfly app or the Dragon Naturally Speaking app for voice to text, if you know which one that was. Um, I believe it's Dragonfly, but I can uh, check with my friend since that is something that he utilizes and uh, find out for sure and post it in the blog later on if that's good. Great, thank you. And so that is going to conclude our question and answer portion. Uh, we really appreciate everybody coming. We will be having any questions we did not get to up on our blog, as we mentioned, so Matt can answer them sometime within the next seven days. Yes, thank you everybody for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. Yes, thank you all for joining our webinar on assistive technology to help with anxiety. There is an exit survey, which we will need everyone in attending to fill out. The webinar blog is open and available for the next seven days on the NJCTS website. And any additional questions that were not covered by tonight's presentation or that you have now um, you can post there that website is www.njcts.org also an archive recording of tonight's webinar will be posted to our website our next presentation in these uncertain times returning to school in an age of anxiety will be presented by dr eric dibler and is scheduled for august 26 2020 this ends tonight's webinar. Thank you, Matt, for your presentation, and thank you, everyone, for attending. Good night.